Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. It is Wednesday, December 8th, 2021. Let's get to the docket. First, Ghislaine Maxwell. Was it personal or business with that guy named Jeff? Scott Peterson gets resentenced, closing arguments in the Jussie Smollett case. Well, the Delphi murders turned out not really to be a lead. And only in New York can you cause $500,000 worth of damage and be charged with misdemeanors. Is this case worth the death penalty? And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Before we get to the docket, a couple of housekeeping matters. First, we are going live this evening, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and then we'll do our Patreon show immediately following that tonight. Had some travel issues, so we couldn't do it last night. Also, if you haven't done so already, please subscribe. Hit that little bell so you receive notifications of when we go live or put up new content. Let's get to the docket. First on the docket, Ghislaine Maxwell. Was it personal or a business with that guy named Jeff? Now, the prosecution wants to say that it was a relationship and they were partners in crime, but that's not exactly the way the evidence is coming out. All right. So there were never before seen photos of Ghislaine Maxwell and uh, her alleged partner in crime. That's right. That guy named Jeff. And for those who don't know, that's right. Can't use that last name. Otherwise, YouTube shuts you down. Well, these pictures show the couple um, loving it up in the Lolita Express. They also have photos of her on the back of a motorcycle on a beautiful tropical vacation and perhaps a little more disturbing, apparently of Ghislaine rubbing Jeffrey's feet. Ooh, feet. Now, the images were obtained during a 2019 raid of that man named Jeff's Manhattan mansion, along with other graphic insights into the ultra luxurious lifestyle of Jeff. The jury was shown these pictures to show the alleged close relationship that the couple allegedly had, according to the prosecutors. And as I stated earlier, the prosecutors are trying to portray the two as partners in crime. But some have testified at the trial so far that they had more of kind of just a business relationship. Now, a woman by the name who uses a pseudonym Caroline took the stand the other day and under cross-examination, she said that she had seen a photo um, in that man named Jeff's house that showed Maxwell nude and pregnant. That's interesting because nobody is aware if Miss Maxwell has any children, uh, but there's been no further details regarding uh, that particular photo in, in any way. Now, an FBI analyst also testified and took the stand and testified that the new 19 photographs that were shown to the jury, and she explained basically where they were found. Now, during cross-examination, she said she didn't know if the images had been altered or photoshopped in any way. And one of the never-before-seen photos shows the couple at Her Majesty's Scottish cabin. That's because it was reported that Prince Andrew had invited the couple to the Balmoral Lodge in 1999. Now, the court also heard from the agent that they had found a Word document created using the name GMAX, which has been linked to Maxwell, that allegedly described the defendant's intimate relationship with that guy named Jeff. It apparently read, Jeffrey and Guy Slain have been together a couple for at least 11 years. Okay, whether they were a couple or not, really what matters is what do the victims say took place as it related to Ghislaine Maxwell. Remember, these photos are not photos of anything inappropriate going on. And frankly, their relevance is probably somewhat limited. As you remember, she's charged with trafficking of these young children for the benefit of that guy named Jeff. So I think the defense is probably going to say, please tell me you have something more. Give me something more than just photographs of a couple on vacation. Show me the photographs of inappropriate conduct with minors taking place. Well, those haven't been produced and I don't think they're coming into evidence. We'll have to wait and see. Right now, it's probably a tie. Guess what happens when it's a tie in a criminal court system? The tie goes to the runner. That's the defendant. But we'll have to wait and see if the jury is convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that Ghislaine Maxwell is guilty as charged. All right, before we continue on with the docket, let's take a quick recess. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about, 
what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're gonna get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's gonna give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're gonna find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's gonna be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. All right, Scott Peterson. That's right. He's the man who was convicted of killing his pregnant wife, Lacey Peterson, and their unborn baby. Well, he was resentenced today to life in prison without the possibility of parole for his wife's death back in 2002. For those of you who are not familiar with this case, it was kind of a big deal. But Lacey Peterson was 27 at the time, and she was eight months pregnant with their son, Connor, when she was killed in December of 2002, five years after she had married Scott Peterson. Now, prosecutors alleged that he had dumped his wife's body in the Berkeley Marina on Christmas Eve and then tried to cover up the crime by making it appear as Lacey Peterson had disappeared. Hmm. Wow, I guess it just isn't a recent phenomenon, is it? No, it's not. A judge sentenced Scott Peterson to 15 years to life in prison for the death of the unborn baby, Connor, and the sentence will run concurrent with the judge's sentence of life without parole. Peterson is now 52 years old and has spent more than 15 years on death row since his murder conviction. Last year, his sentence was overturned by the state Supreme Court there in California after it was determined that a juror who disagreed with the death penalty were in fact dismissed from the trial. Now, Peterson has tried to have his conviction overturned with his attorneys claiming that a juror, known as juror number seven, was untruthful and she didn't disclose that she was in fact a victim of domestic violence. Now, before he was sentenced uh, Wednesday, uh, Lacey Peterson's mother, sister, and brother all addressed the court. Sharon Roca said she still feels grief 19 years after her daughter's murder and that she has never seen any sorrow or remorse from Scott Peterson at all. Lacey's sister, Amy Roca, said, even though the death penalty has been lifted, you will still be punished in this life and after. Now, if Peterson is granted a new trial, his attorneys say that they will present new evidence that supports their claim that Lacey Peterson was killed when she stumbled upon a burglary at her house. A hearing on those allegations is scheduled for late February of 2022. We'll see what happens there. Closing arguments began today in the Jussie Smollett trial. And uh, Mr. Smollett arrived at the courthouse to hear closing arguments with the support of his mother and sister who had been there throughout the trial. Now, the jury was shown pictures of one of the Nigerian brothers who allegedly attacked Jesse Smollett. And um, that's from the assault back in July as well in September and January of 19 of the two out clubbing together. Now, 10 days after the clubbing photos were taken, it was when the alleged hate crime uh, took place. There's also video footage of the two of them from a 2018 show uh, where the pair was drunk inside a nightclub. Now, Smollett admitted during the trial that the pair were friends, saying that they were even sometimes intimate with each other, but he says he didn't hang out with Ola, the other brother who Jesse uh, Smollett testified uh, stated creeped him out. In closing arguments, the special prosecutor, Dan Webb, addressed the jury telling the actor deliberately tailored his testimony to avoid the truth and lied to them repeatedly under oath. There's no question that Mr. Smollett is the person who orchestrated this attack. According to the prosecutor, Mr. Smollett uh, went on the witness stand and made many, many false statements to you. The prosecutor stated that he lied under oath to you, the jurors, in the course of this trial. Webb also said that Mr. Smollett knew that there was significant evidence that would show that he was the one who orchestrated this alleged hate crime and that he deliberately labeled his attackers as white because he knew that that would make a bigger story. Webb called it ridiculous to suggest that the brothers who were identified through evidence as being the people on the street on the night of the attack were there for any other reason. Surveillance footage and Uber accounts also matched the Nigerian brothers, placing them at the crime scene. Webb also referred to a text Smollett sent to Abel 
after his February 14th arrest where Smallot said he's 1,000% supporting him and knew he had done nothing wrong. He said it was a deliberate attempt to manipulate him. The defense will begin their closing argument this afternoon, and who knows, maybe we'll even have a jury. Now, one thing that Mr. Smollett may want to consider here, it was anticipated that even if he was convicted, he probably wouldn't get prison. However, if the court were to believe, let's say, assuming hypothetically there is a conviction for Mr. Smollett, the fact that he got up and lied, if the jury disregards his testimony, that could actually open him up to getting a prison sentence. You know, it's one thing to make the government prove their case. It's another to allegedly get up and lie. And if the court thinks you got up and lied because you think you could get up and lie and manipulate, guess what? The court could potentially whack him. Obviously, we'll give Mr. Smollett the presumption of innocence, and we'll see what the jury is convinced of beyond a reasonable doubt. All right, yesterday we brought you the story about a potential tip in the Delphi murders. Well, apparently that lead has been followed, and it is nothing of a lead, really. So there was a recent social media account that was linked to the Delphi Snapchat murders. Well, it turns out the photos were stolen by a catfish, somebody that puts up a fake account to try to get pretty people to date them or meet them when in fact they're probably kind of ugly. Um, well, apparently those photos are of a model turned police officer who is obviously now assisting in the investigation. The former fashion model and father of two is a patrol officer in Ketchikan, Alaska with their police department. And this officer found himself wrapped up in the middle of the Delphi murder investigation when his photos were used on a Snapchat and Instagram under the username of Anthony underscore shots in 26 and 2017. Now in a news release, the Indiana State Police said the creator of the profile used the model's photo to catfish underage girls and to solicit nude images, obtaining their addresses and attempting to meet these young girls. These images were reportedly used without the knowledge of the now police officer um, or his consent. But at least that lead has been followed up on and maybe they can actually find the real guy who is using that account because apparently, allegedly, he was obviously doing some nefarious things trying to get young women uh, to meet him and send photos. All right, next on the docket, only in New York City, that's right, you can burn down something, cause half a million dollars in damage and be charged with misdemeanors. So Craig Tamahana, who is described as homeless and possibly emotionally disturbed, faces six misdemeanor charges of torching News Corp's 50-foot Christmas tree in New York City. Apparently, Fox News employees called police after watching Tamahana climb the tree at 12.14 a.m. Wednesday and set it on fire. Arson is only constituted a felony in New York if the perpetrator harms or attempts to harm a person or if the act is considered a hate crime, meaning that the defendant will be free to go because of the city's lenient bail reform. Now, although Tema Nahana could be held by a judge for a psychiatric evaluation, if he is experiencing mental illness, it'll be likely that he'll be released. As I stated, it's alleged that he caused about $500,000 in property damage. The police say that it was a completely random act and was not politically motivated in any way. And the defendant has at least two prior arrests in New York, one in February, one in March, both for drug possession. Now, like I said, Tamanahana is now in police custody awaiting transfer and is scheduled to be in court later this afternoon. Like I said, well, he'll probably get a PR bond unless there's a mental hold placed on him. Only in New York, ladies and gentlemen, only in New York. Dun, 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 dun. Next on the docket, these two guys could face the death penalty. Do you think they deserve the death penalty? Let me know. So two men allegedly broke into Richard Phillips' Springdale, Arkansas home after a teenage girl reportedly told them that Mr. Phillips had sexually abused her when she was younger. The girl was reportedly at a party with all three men when she told Mr. Baker that this allegedly happened. Mr. Baker reportedly became angry, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and claimed that he wanted to harm Mr. Phillips. Now, the woman was able to convince him not to attack Mr. Phillips that night, but a month later, two men broke into Phillips' home, beat him up, and dragged his body out of the apartment and into their pickup truck. Daniel Blanks, 43, and Reginald Baker, 40, of Seligam, Missouri, 
were charged with capital murder, kidnapping, and burglary after the victim, Richard Phillips' body, was found in the woods. After the attack, the young lady who was allegedly abused by Mr. Phillips reportedly called her family and said Phillips was dead where he should be. She also allegedly sent them pictures from the crime scene. Now, police spoke with Baker and Blanks in Oklahoma while they were sitting in Baker's truck. Blanks' truck was parked nearby and matched the one seen on the security footage from Phillips' apartment. Now, while searching the vehicle, police reportedly found blood in Blank's car and a shotgun in Baker's truck. The next day, a group of hunters found the body in the Mark Twain National Forest, and police used Phillips' tattoos to confirm the body was his and observed what had been beaten badly with multiple uh, gunshots as well. Now, injuries to the body also indicated deliberate mutilation that would have been in retaliation for the sex offense allegations, according to the court documents. I wonder what that could have been. Hmm. The two men are facing the death penalty or life in prison without parole if they are convicted of capital murder. Obviously, you can't have vigilante justice, but I assure you one of the things the defense attorneys are going to be using for mitigation is was, well, that the dead guy deserved killing. And depending on where that trial is going to be held, someone may just agree with it. Kind of like that uh, book, right? A Time to Kill. Hmm. We'll see what a jury will do. And finally on the docket today, our dumb criminal of the day. Investigators allege that Anthony James Silcox sold meth from a waffle house in Carryville, Tennessee, a town 30 miles north of Knoxville. Now, police raided the waffle house and arrested Silcox while he was standing at the grill. The police found 3.3 grams of a crystal-like substance as well as paraphernalia on Silcox at the time of the arrest. The waffle house cook admitted to selling meth inside the breakfast chain but said that he does not sell methamphetamine every day, but has sold methamphetamine several times in the past. Mr. Silcox, you are a dumb criminal of the day. Well, for one, for selling drugs. Two, for selling meth. It's a scourge. It destroys everything it touches. And then finally, for admitting to the police that you were selling drugs from this place of business. Somehow I think Waffle House isn't going to bring you back, but maybe you want to release remember those uh, recipes, particularly the hash browns with cheese, and onions. Love that stuff. All right. That's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.